really cool when kids are just starting to get to discover the world and they discover shadows for the first time. Um, because shadows always look so much more imposing than the reality. Um, they're quite reflective of the reality in some ways, aren't they? Like sometimes you look at a shadow and you're like, wow, it's kind of like an exact representation of what the substance of the thing or the person is. Then there's other times that the shadow is not representative. Do you know what I mean? It's like, wow, I look like a giant. Or wow, I can't possibly be that large. Um, and then you look in the mirror and you realise maybe I'm a little bit larger than what I thought I was last week. <laughs> and I think that's part of uh, maturing in life is understanding the difference between the shadow and the substance of things. I think to use the shadow, the, word, the idea of a shadow as a metaphor for life, I think there's shadows in a lot of things in life, isn't there? There's a shadow of joy and there's true joy. There's the appearance of joy and there's true joy. There's the appearance of love and there's true love. And sometimes there's a difference between the shadow and the substance, isn't there? Um, Bishop Moso was talking Mosa was talking this morning about before he had children, he used to judge parents on how rebellious their children were. And he used to make statements in his heart and also out loud to his wife about the kind of people, that, the kind of parents that they were going to be. And so there's, there's a difference between the shadow and the substance of parenting. There's the appearance and then there's the perception and there's the substance. Um, the scriptures talk about Shadows as, yeah, generally shadows come after the object, don't they? So you've got an object, you've got the sun, the sun shines on a person and then behind the person you see the shadow. But in the scriptures, it talks about shadows in the other direction. It talks about shadows as being things in the Old Testament. The old way of seeing God for the people of God not necessarily evil or bad. Actually, shadows are good. But how many people know that the shadow is not the substance? The shadow points to the substance that is so much greater than the shadow. And so in the Old Testament scriptures, there's things, there's echoes and there's signs and there's symbols and there's shadows that point to a greater substance. Colossians 2 verse 17 says that these things... A whole range of uh, requirements. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul had been talking about some requirements for living holy lives, some requirements for being the people of God. And he's talking through what are the things that we have to keep on doing and what are the things that we have to not keep on doing. And he says, these things are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, the reality however or the substance, is found in Christ. And so, so many things of the Old Testament story are shadows of the substance that is Christ. And so really, we would say that the law in the Old Testament is not evil, the law is good. And in fact, in the law, we see the character and the holiness of God. And so, I don't like it when people diminish or people talk down the Old Testament or people talk down uh, the Jewish faith that we read about in the Old Testament. In fact, it was a wonderful faith. It was a faith born out of the gracious God giving of himself to a people and saying, I'm going to be your God. And those people were able to enter into a relationship with the God that had already entered into a relationship with them. And they were able to, uh, they were able to express their relationship through keeping the law. But that relationship was already initiated by the God of Israel, Israel Yahweh. And so they didn't design these laws. God said, these are some laws to align you with what my heart and what my character is all about so you can really look like my people. And so the law is a shadow of what was to come in Christ. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, the law is only a shadow. Everyone say shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be the same. Sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. You see, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament of killing goats 
and other animals to make atonement for the sins of people was a shadow of the substantive sacrifice of Jesus by which he was the Lamb of God and his blood was spilled for the sins of the world. And so it says in Romans chapter 3 that there's this sense that all of those other sacrifices in the Old Testament, God didn't forgive people because they killed animals. God forgave people even in the Old Testament because of the sacrifice of Jesus. He just overlooked their sins and he received their sacrifices that were made by faith. And so the Old Testament sacrificial system was a shadow of the good to come in Jesus. Amen? Hebrews 8, just a couple of chapters earlier, it says, uh, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Isn't that cool? And so we actually have the imagery in the Old Testament, and you can do a whole study on this. There's a lot of temple language in the Old Testament. There's temple language in the Garden of Eden, and then you've got the tabernacle itself, and then you've got even, even in one sense, Noah's Ark is almost like a mini temple where God redeems people and God communes with people in the midst of chaos outside. And so you've got this, this idea of temple and God dwelling with his people in the Garden of Eden, in the tabernacle, in the temple. But all of those sanctuaries were just a shadow of tr the true intimacy that we will have with God in heaven. And... Um, we can go on and on. Why do I say all this? I think that there's sometimes a difference between the Christian faiths that we enjoy and the reality that is available. I would say that some of us are living a shadowy Christian life and not a true life of Christian integrity. We're not enjoying the fullness of what is available. In fact, just this morning, I felt God speak to me through a scripture that I've referenced many, many, many times. But sometimes it's not until you read it and you hear it preached that you see it differently. Now, I have not done a study on this because I just saw it this morning, but I felt God speak to me about it. And it was in Ezekiel 36. It's a prophecy where God is saying, I will remove their heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. And uh, I thought, wow, that's really interesting. You know what I saw in the translation? It actually says that God will take from our flesh a heart of stone and replace a heart of flesh in our flesh. And I thought, do you know what I, I saw for the first time? You as men and women made in the image of God were not designed to have hard hearts. It's actually a lack of integrity to your crea the creative design with which God made you in His image. You see, God actually designed you in His image, in His likeness to create and to love and to risk and to give and to sacrifice. And so you're made in the image of God. And so when you have a heart of stone, a hard heart, that is impenetrable, that is actually a contradiction. It's, it's, it's a lack of integrity of who you are. And so God wants to actually set that right and take out of your flesh the heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh. I may have just taken that completely out of context and that may not be what the text is saying, but I saw it there. I saw flesh, stone, flesh. And I think that God wants to build an integrity into your heart that when you live the Christian life, that you actually embody what it means to be a follower of Jesus or a mini Christ, as the early Christians were called. That we would be people that read the Scriptures and we don't have to just blank out the bits that we don't experience. That we don't have to be Christians that when we read the bits about forgiveness, we just look over them because we don't want to forgive. Or when we read the bits about generosity, we don't like being generous because people need to work hard and they need to just do their own. And so the poor deserve to be poor. And so why would I help the poor? Or maybe you read the scriptures and you read about miracles and then you say, well, I have never seen anyone healed from a prayer, so that can't be true. So I'm just going to flip over all the bits about miracles and healings. The funny thing about people that don't 
uh, believe in healing is I find people that don't believe in healing very rarely pray for people to be healed. I believe, this is a radical idea, I reckon some people that don't believe God heals today, if you just prayed for people, God might still choose to heal through you. Just to surprise you. Just to show you that the scriptures are alive and that God's spirit is alive and God's spirit wants to touch and bless and love. There's a difference between the shadow and the substance. You see, in 2 Corinthians 1.22, I don't have this. It talks about us as followers of Jesus being anointed by the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, the people that were anointed were kings and were prophets and were priests. And they would have oil poured onto their head. And it was, it's kind of like we, we anoint people with oil in a really modern kind of way. It's like we do a little tiny dabble on their forehead just so it's not intrusive. But, you know, if anyone comes out tonight, I'll pour oil over your head. No worries. Just we'll be biblical about it. That's fine. Um, but you, when you're anointed, you knew that you're anointed. It wasn't a hypothetical anointing. Either you were anointed, you were blessed and set apart and consecrated, or you weren't. And so when it says... In, what, in 2 Corinthians 1.22, that we are anointed by the Holy Spirit. It means that we have a special priestly access to God. We can go direct to God, just like the priests in the Old Testament did. And it says that we have been anointed by Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, He comes to seal um, our salvation he comes to remind us of who we are in Christ. He reminds us that we are children of God. And it also says in that passage, 2 Corinthians 1.22, that he is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Guaranteeing. Isn't that good? So when you make a deposit for a house that you have saved for, for 10 years, and you hand over that deposit of $40,000, you know that you've made a deposit. And the bank knows that you've made a deposit because there's $40,000 that wasn't there before. God has made a deposit into your life and it's a guarantee of what is to come. And I believe that for some of us, we need to have a healthy expectation of an experience with God. Not that we will fully experience all of the joy and ecstasy of what it means to be with God in heaven right now. Not that we will be set free completely by our shoddy bodies that don't do everything that they want to do. Not that we will never die and we'll live to a million until Jesus returns. But that the Spirit has been given as a guarantee of what is to come. And so um, I heard one New Testament scholar say, it is impossible to comprehend any Christian in the New Testament church being a follower of Jesus and not having an, had an experience of the Spirit. It's, it's like saying, did early Christians ever choose not to get baptized? It's kind of like, why are you asking that question? It's kind of like it comes with a package. You're a follower of Jesus. Jesus got baptized. That's what we do. We've always done it that way. It's what he told us to do. So why are we even talking about this? That was the early church pattern. The early church pattern was a, a lived encounter with Christ through the Holy Spirit. And so that's why the New Testament writers speak so much about the person of the Holy Spirit. I think even in churches like today, like, like ours, a Pentecostal church like this, we can diminish the person of the Holy Spirit and lived reality of his presence. And we should expect experience is not everything, but it's not nothing. The first um, passage, the other, next passage I want to look at, I'm going to just read. It's from the message paraphrase, and, um, which is a wonderful kind of re-reading and interpretation in modern language of a wonderful passage. And it's worth reading this passage in a, a more direct, um, literal translation as well. But I think it's really helpful in the message. Uh, we're going to look at Colossians 2, verses 6 to 10. Dan, thank you. 
And then after this, I'm going to invite Cass up to share a couple of things that God's been doing this week. My counsel for you, have we got this one, Colossians? Normally I'm very impatient and I just move on. I'm going to go a bit slower. Thank you. My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Isn't that good for all of us that aren't that smart? Just go ahead with what you've been given. You've received Christ Jesus. Isn't that good? If, you're, if you are a Christian and you've got spirit in you, you've already received Christ Jesus, the master. Now live him. Oh, that's good. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. He's your foundation. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill out into thanksgiving. Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. Who is the greatest theologian that ever lived? Jesus. The answer is always Jesus, just for what it's worth. He didn't get caught up and try to dazzle people with his intellect. He just was the truth and he spoke the truth. They spread their ideas through the empty tra traditions of human beings and empty superstitions of spirit beings. You know, even in a church like us, and even if you, if you've been part of a church for any longer than three years, you are probably have developed some traditions. And those traditions can become unhealthy for you in experiencing the reality of the presence and power of God in your life. Not that tradi traditions are good. Actually, traditions are neither good nor bad. They're both. It's like culture. Culture's not good or bad. There's bad culture and there's good culture. There's good tradition and there's bad tradition. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in Him. So you can see and hear Him clearly. You don't need a telescope, a microscope or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without Him. When you come to Him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. I just wanted to go back to that little bit where it says, now that you've been taught, now that you've been founded in faith, you know your way around the faith, school's out, quit studying and start living it. I believe that narrowing the gap between the shadow and the substance is actually stepping out and trusting that God wants us to experience the reality of the normal Christian life of reaching people for the gospel, praying for the sick and seeing God's power break into a lost and lonely world. Amen. And when we actually see Jesus minister through us, there is a connecting between the scriptures and between our life. And rather than our life being a shadowy Christianity, it becomes a more integrated, robust and also healthy Christian faith that looks like the faith we read about in the scriptures. <coughs> So I'm going to invite Pastor Cass up to share about a fantastic testimony of healing and also of a, a, an opportunity for evangelism that she's had in the last couple of days. Will you welcome her? Thank you. Well, God's just amazing. And um, it's amazing when he uses you in ways that you don't expect. And it reminds you again that he really is amazing. <laughs> um. Going to Hillsong this year, excuse my voice, I've sort of had a bit of a horse, horse voice, so listen in close and you'll hear. Um, going to Hillsong this year, as I sat down in my seat, the first thing that popped into my head is I felt like the Holy Spirit just put these thoughts into my head. I'm so much bigger than you think I am and I can do way more than you think I can do. And that's been like a theme ever since then. I've got just all the time just saying, you know what? You think you've got me pegged? No, 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 no. I can do so much more than you expect. Um, so I say that because I went to the healing clinic that happened at the National Conference this week with um, feeling very tired. It's just been a very full ministry season for me. Um, we had a, we've had our kids outreach. We've had a Dare Women's event. We've had just lots of stuff that's been on. 
Um, so I was feeling really tired, but I thought, no, I want to go. I want to be part of what God wants to do. And we were invited to go a bit early so we could pray together and then pray for people who came to be. And I I've, I've, I've basically went thinking, God, you know what? I actually really want someone to just lay hands on me. <laughs> I'm feeling really tired, but I'm going and, you know, I'm not going to strive or try anything that you want to do. You know, you have your way. So I got there and as we were there, Pastor Ian Miller just got said, look, it's good to just work, come with the atmosphere of faith and worship. Let's just pray for one another. So I'm going around praying for people, feel like God's giving me these encouragements for people. And then this girl from Kingston turns to me and says, all right, we're going to pray for you. I'm like, okay. So they start praying and they had this prophetic picture for me, which was pretty cool. And then Janet Bryce is a pastor from this church, comes up behind, she puts her hand on my back and she's like, yes, amen, yes, that's good. <laughs> and some of it was more of a personal nature, but she, she sort of got to the end of it and she said, <clears throat> and I feel like today, I can't even remember all of what she said, I feel like today the Lord wants to do some creative miracles through you. He wants to use you to do some creative miracles. I'm like, okay. I don't even know what that was. I'm like thinking it's something to do with singing creative. Like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Just shows you that it's so good. Um, and then, so that was great. Okay, thank you. And we're, we're going off and people are coming in and praying. And Janet Bryce pulls me aside and she goes, <clears throat> you know what, God just spoke to me, you know, you've been prayed for and I'm standing there going, yes, hey man, yes, that's so good. And God just reminded me that I need a creative miracle. Would you pray for me? And I was like, okay. She goes, when I was, um, well, since I was born, I've had my kneecaps have been on the side of my knee, not in the middle. There's nothing the doctors can do other than somehow do surgery that makes them float. Which, and she was having a bit of pain with them and stuff. So she felt like God spoke to her. And I'm like, okay. So it was amazing. So I'm like, all right. So we start praying. And all, I was just praying in the spirit, praying in my, heaven, my prayer language. And all I could do was this, that scripture in Matthew 17, 20, I didn't know the reference, came into my mind. <laughs> if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And I'm like... That's about how I feel right now, God. <laughs> um, so I just started praying. I prayed that scripture and I said, now in the name of Jesus, move. And like her kneecap moved under my hand. It was so crazy. And she was like, oh, 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 oh. Didn't hurt her, but she could feel it too. And I'm like going, oh my goodness, did you just feel that? <laughs> so on her, what side am I on? On her left knee, it's moved into the middle. And that's just, that is a creative miracle. Now I know what they're talking about. <laughs> I had no idea what I meant. And the other one, we definitely prayed for that, and that moved as well, but it's not come quite into the middle, but it was quite inflamed. So we stopped praying, and then this other guy comes up and goes, are you just praying for your knee? Guess what? Ian Miller just prayed for me, and my kneecap moved into the middle. <laughs> So he comes and prays with her as well. And then later on, this other guy said to her, he had this, this picture in his mind's eye of this fluid in her knee on the right, just draining out through the bottom of her foot. And, and all the swelling has gone. So we're believing that, you know, that's going to actually be completely healed as well. So, I mean, now that is amazing. Like to have to be born with something and God move it without causing her any pain. Just like, it was like, I can't describe it. And it blew my mind and it opened my eyes to how big God is and to not limit him or, yeah, I think sometimes we can have in our mindset, yes, you're the God who can heal, but when he does something that's over and above, that's extraordinary, that's impossible through you, it's just like, God. You know, I was just like walking on air for the rest of the whole conference, just amazed at what he can do. So all glory to him. <coughs> and you can talk to Janet when she gets back. She's so excited. Um, so that was that. And then um, we leave. The, it was such a good conference. We finished the conference and I'm going driving to the airport. I have to drop off my car, hire, um, my hired car to, to the place where I'd hired it to get back. And um, I'm driving along and the traffic just goes deadlocked. I left heaps with heaps of time before I needed to be there. Um, but just goes down. So I'm stuck in traffic for 45 minutes. I get to the airport after dropping off my car and everything like that, and they said, I'm sorry, 
your plane hasn't left yet, but it's closed, so you can't catch the plane. So this is 10, 10 a.m. in the morning. I'm like, okay, righto. Um, which I was a bit bummed about because Yen and Lewis, some of you would know, got married, and I was planning to try, like fly in and then just even if I came in my jeans, come to the wedding and cheer them on. So I got I didn't get to go to their wedding, which I was a bit bummed about. And I was um, when I was inquired about it, they said the next flight that they could get me on was 8:30 at night. So I'm like, wow, that's pretty long. <laughs> okay, which I was also sad about because I didn't get to see my kids. Like they would have gone to bed by then. I'm just like, ah. So I was twiddling my thumbs, found a little coffee shop, a little that had a book, sells books in it, and just sat in there and chatted away. Alan Steele, the same thing happened to him, Pastor Alan Steele. So we chatted for a little bit as well, and then he went off. He got the last flight on the 5.30. <laughs> he did offer to swap. Good on him. Um, <laughs> but I was sort of there, and, and I'm reading through my notes from the conference, just, just praying and reflecting about how impacting they were, and one of the messages that Pastor Mosa gave was about compelling people, you know, compelling people to come to know the Lord and using whatever means to really just be open to the Holy Spirit but to, to be passionate about seeing people come to know Christ. And I was sitting there thinking, God, I, I'm so not passionate about that sometimes. Like I get locked in my own zone like everyone does and I want to be used by you for that. Anyway, finally get on the plane and um. I'm sitting there and I feel prompted just to start praying, not out loud, <laughs> because I feel like, well, maybe, I just had this thought, maybe one of the reasons why my flight was delayed is because you've set up something here, God. Who knows? So I'm like, I was just like, all right, well, I'm open to what you want to do. I'm not going to make anything happen, but if there's something you want me to say, here I am. So I'm sitting next to this girl. And I was thinking, cool, all right. She seems like she just wants to go to sleep. <laughs> um, just before the plane takes off, she, this, this guy comes in and she moves over one seat and he plonks himself in the middle in between us. And, um, yeah, so just, just as the plane takes off, basically, he looks to me and goes, so, what do you do? <laughs> like, okay, help me, Lord. And so we just start chatting and I ask him about what he does, ask him if he's got any faith background. Um, he's travelling from Dubai to visit his brother in Adelaide comes from a Catholic background but had a whole heap of questions and um, I was just talking about my faith but basically I got to share the gospel with him which was such a privilege and tell him about Jesus and talk. he had all these thoughts about you know there's there's bad people and then there's average people and then there's really good people and we talked all about what God's grace is and how we can't earn it and that we need Jesus we all need Jesus and um, then I invited him to church on sun, Sunday today um, which I can't see him here and I don't think he came this morning, but who knows what that seed of faith planted in his life and I'm just believing that. Um, I just said, you know, it's a free gift that you can receive and ask Christ into your life at any time. So who knows? But I'm praying for him and it was such a privilege to be used by Jesus in that way. Thanks, Cass. And so Jesus' way of making disciples is by saying, well, school's still in, but it's also school's out. So we actually learn by doing. And um, that's how people, that's how most people learn anything, is by doing. And I think sometimes we also, I talked before about experience. Cass had an experience with God on the airplane, but she felt like death warmed up because she's been at the airport all day. Like, you know when you've been at the airport all day, you feel like minus 10 humanity? You just feel like you need to shower just to just feel like, oh, just being around airports. And discouragement, not seeing her kids, hasn't seen her kids for most of the week. Um, missed out on a fantastic wedding. <laughs> but, you know, but that's what got, but she had an encounter, an experience with God. But she wouldn't have had that experience if she wasn't leaning in and praying and seeking and opening her mouth and speaking the gospel. Do you know what I mean? Um, Cass had an encounter with God praying for people when she could have said, I'm a pastor, I'm at a pastor's conference and I just want to receive. Because I'm sick of giving out to those people. 
And they always just want more prayer and want more support and want more love. This conference is about me. But Cass went there and said, no, I want to pray for whoever needs to. And I'm open. And she prayed for her friend Janet. And God did a creative miracle that has never occurred before in Janet Bryce's life. And so that is an experience of God. And I think when we think about experience, we think of a passive involuntary experience, like a reflex action. But that's not where most positive experiences in our life come from, particularly love experiences. Love experiences involve faith and risk and participation. It's like the difference between knowing that love exists and actually taking the risk to love. Another scripture that messes with my theology is John 14, 1, uh, 11 to 12. And it says, when Jesus says, believe me when I say, I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the work themselves. Wow. Did Jesus really say that? <laughs> He's actually pointing to the evidence of his power through his works. Now, they're not everything, but they're not nothing. And then he goes on to say, very truly, I tell you, probably King James would have said verily, a word that definitely needs to come back. Verily, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, praise God. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. That is not what I would have written if I was Jesus. Why did Jesus say that? He is God in the flesh. He is perfect. He's fully submitted to the Spirit. He did incredible miracles. Why did he say to his followers, you'll do greater things? You will do my works. So first of all, the starting point is doing the works of Jesus. Just modeling ourselves upon his priorities. You know, you can be in a church for your whole life and never do. I, was ta- I talked to someone in this church that had been in this church all their life and they'd never shared their faith with a non-Christian, ever. And when they did it, I challenged, we had a talk about it, we challenged each other and then he came back to me and said, Tim, I did it. And it was one of the most exhilarating things in my whole life. He said, I felt alive. I felt nervous. I felt on fire. And he said, it, it, it made me want to know God more. It made me want to study more. It also grew my love and my desire to see that happen more and more. I think how often we settle for the shadow over the substance. Amen. You see, how did Jesus say that? Well, how do we do greater things than Jesus? Well, we're people of the Spirit and the Spirit can be anywhere in the world. Jesus was geographically in one place at one time. The Spirit of God has been poured out upon all flesh. And so right across the world, God's Spirit is seeing wonders and miracles confirming the preaching of the gospel, not undermining or not replacing the preaching of the gospel, but confirming the preaching of the gospel and the message of the kingdom of God. And so the Spirit is everywhere. And the church is so much bigger. The ministry of what Jesus is doing through the Spirit in the church now is far greater than when he was on this planet. Far more diverse, far more broad. And some of the miracles that are happening in the world are miracles. I was talking to someone just two days ago that actually has been part of, of, of uh, seeing people see, blind, the blind see, through people spitting into dirt and rubbing it on their eyes. The exact miracle that Jesus did. Um, I, I met an, an Iraqi pastor the other day who was the pastor, he started the first church in Iraq after the Allied invasion. And some of the miracles that he saw like, were phenomenal. He said pretty much all of the miracles of the New Testament, the Baghdad church has witnessed. And I've heard that from Canon Andrew White as well. There is signs and wonders and miracles going on in the Middle East like you have never heard of in a country like Australia. And also, technology today. There are more people, that people have come to Christ in more multitudes in this century than in the days of Jesus because of technology and so there's great revivals and groups of people witnessing the gospel people in the Muslim world hearing the gospel on radio in their millions greater things than these you will do so what's the sign of true faith 
The sign of true faith is believing God. Not saying, oh, I want to believe. I'm going to strive. I'm going to fire, stir up faith in my heart. No, it's just saying, yep, you've said it. I believe it. It's theoretically true. Yep, I believe that it's probably true for me as well. I'm not living in that experience, so I'm going to believe that you want me to walk in that in my life. Even if I don't feel it, I'm going to believe it by faith. That's what faith is. Why was Abraham the great father of faith? Because he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Another passage I wanted to reference was Galatians 3, where it says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You started in the Spirit, but now you've descended into into the flesh. And you started in the Spirit. Did you receive the Spirit by works of law? And he goes, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? You see, when you received Christ and you became a Christian, that was actually an encounter of the Spirit. Where the Spirit, actually you didn't receive Jesus, you received Spirit, Holy Spirit. And when you receive Holy Spirit, that was actually the sign and the guarantee and the building block of the life in the Spirit that should come and flow. And so I just want to believe that even tonight we are going to have a worship time of worship, but also an encounter with God's Spirit, where we're going to pray for the sick and they will be made, they will be healed. We will pray for people that are feeling afflicted and oppressed and that they will be set free by the power of the gospel and by the power of prayer. And that other things, other things that people have come into church tonight and that you're carrying, maybe you're here and you're just saying, I want power to reach people with the gospel. I want power to break through a temptation in my life. I want power to do something that I've kept on failing at, but I want to overcome. And tonight, why don't we just stop thinking about it and stop trying to debate it in our minds and just say, I believe by faith that God wants to do it in me because it's not about me. It's about him and his kingdom and people. So why don't we stand to our feet?